My only fear is that the Zulu will avoid engagement. Lord Chelmsford, yep, this guy. Doesn't seem particularly likeable, does he? Well, he was commander of the British Army during that invasion of Zululand in 1879, including that disastrous defeat at Isandwana. But was he to blame for that? Stay tuned till the end to find out more. There's some pics of him on display here at the Clash of Empires exhibition at the Royal Philatelic Society that's currently taking place until the end of July. But was Chelmsford a good general? What's his background? How did he perform? And what happened to him after the war? Chelmsford was very much a professional soldier. Um, unlike other officers that would be out getting drunk, he would be in the library reading the latest articles in Rusi Journal or whatever else it so might be. So quite rare for that era. Yeah, he was. I mean, he was very professional, if you like. That's Professor John Laband, South African military historian and author of this new book on Chelmsford. Before the Zulu War, Chelmsford had just led British troops to victory in the 9th Cape Frontier War against the Amakosa people. Perhaps in some ways that victory was too easy. Which did a lot for his confidence. Um, everybody thought he'd done well in the end. Um, he, he, gets, he gets knighted, um, you know, and everything seems to be going particularly well. So next up was the Zulus. Sir Bartle Freer, who was the civilian in command in South Africa, ordered Chelmsford to make a plan for the invasion of Zululand, a much tougher prospect. He decided to invade using multiple columns that would converge on the Zulu capital of Alundi. But was that a good idea? Do you know, subsequently, um, the horse guards, when Chelmsford was very much on the carpet, were saying what was wrong with his plans. And they didn't like the idea that he decided to invade Zululand essentially in five separate columns, all converging on Ondini, Echuaya's principal place. Now, the argument was from the horse guards looking at Isantawana, well, all of these columns were too weak. They would have been defeated by the Zulu army. Chelmsford's rationale... They defeated in detail. They in, could have just taken one out detail. at a time. That's right. But Chelmsford's argument, having seen what happened in the Eastern Cape, against the Amakosa was that a modern army with Martini Henry, Martini Henry rifles with seven pounders and all the rest of it was capable of taking out any number of African foes. And the idea was to, in fact to have small columns going in that would tempt the Zulu to attack them in force in the open and you would be then be expecting to you would be expected to defeat the Zulu in detail. Um, you also hope by having separate columns, that this would do something to put the Zulu off attempting to attack Natal because they'd be coming through invading columns and this might dissuade them. So there was rationale there. The whole problem was, as the horse guards also finally decided, and many of Chelmsford's officers did as well, is that the what ruined everything was the Ninth Cape Frontier War because that was too easy. And especially the very first conflict of the war um, against Zahayo's homestead before the Battle of Isantawana. That was an easy business. The Zulu were flushed out. Um, ah, said everybody, this is going to be just like fighting the Alankosa all over again. So it was total overconfidence and an expectation that you'd beat these guys no matter what. So that was the, really the crux of it. And that's what the horse guards decided in the end. It's this, this overconfidence that led to the future calamities. And obviously you've analysed, you know, all of his decisions of this mm. period. Mm. What do you make of his plan? You know, there is an irony that, again, this overconfidence. Isantuani could say the disaster there was dividing your force in the face of the enemy, leaving some of the camp going off on the reconnaissance in force. But on the very same day, General Wood had left part of his force in camp and gone off on an expedition also divided his force. So that was the northern column up at Bemba's column. the northern column, column yeah. yeah. And the coastal column, there it was in an ex drawn out, extended um, convoy, where the, the rear of the convoy never even came into the battle anyway. This is at Niazane on the and same Nizane, day. Yeah. yeah, so if in fact the main Zulu army had attacked then, you would have expected the same result as at Isantuana, as at um, up at Woods Camp. I mean, basically all the British commanders were lax about this. They expected it to be to be easy. And as we know, things were far from easy. On the 22nd of January 1879, while Chelmsford was up in the hills conducting a reconnaissance in force, a British garrison of over 1,300 men were wiped out at Isantuana. 
there's a battle where he wasn't even present. One always forgets that. <laughs> so, That's true. So, you know, um, so ill luck did attend his campaign. Part of the problem, again, is the Cape Frontier War because their extended firing lines had been sufficient. Um, that's just what you had at a Santa Juana, but not sufficient against a, ma a major Zulu force coming in like this. On the other hand, Chelmsford, of course, put up this huge campaign to blame everybody except himself. Um, Poulain for his, his dispositions, um, Durnford for galloping in and then moving off on the right flank and pulling everyone behind him. And there is a certain degree of truth in all of that, of course, that, that if they're consolidated, if they'd formed square, if they'd, they didn't even need the wagons, if they'd simply formed a large infantry square, that, as at Alundi, that would have been enough, actually, you know, um, probably to hold the Zulu off. So, so there were mistakes made on the spot. But then you could say it is Chelmsford's fault for not giving better instructions, for not lagering the camp, um, you know, so, and indeed just for dividing his force in the face of the enemy, as they say. Not, not, not right. So, so he has a certain responsibility but obviously as a general officer commanding his is the ultimate responsibility you get this great effort not me not me it's everybody else's fault and this goes on even after the war which is usually the sign of a bad leader in any profession isn't it it is actually yeah i think the problem is that having suffered his Santa luana he then overreacted after a period of a really of a nervous breakdown for a period after a desperate call back to england for reinforcements um you then pull yourself together, and then it's so careful, because when you go off and relieve a shawi where the coastal column is being blockaded, you do it step by step, you lager every inch of the way, you don't fight in the open, you fight from behind a lager. Um, when you mount the second invasion, again, it is slow, slow, slow. I mean, his own, own motto was, slow and steady wins the race, which is not that exciting, you know. Um, not exactly blitzkrieg, is it? No, no, it's really not, except, of course, when he learned that he was going to be superseded, when he got the telegram um, finally on the 6th of June saying, by the way, Woolsey is coming out, he said, OK, I'm not listening to the telegram. And amazingly, he suddenly got into his fifth gear and galloped off to Lundi to win his battle before Woolsey could come in and steal his thunder. So, so there was know, a bit of ego at play there. Oh, there, there was a lot of ego there in the end. And I mean, I mean his wife was, was writing to Wood, in fact, saying, you know, I hope I hope he wins his battle before Woolsey gets there. I mean, so there was a very conscious effort, and his staff as well. We've got to do this before this horrible model of a major, modern major general actually arrives on the scene, you know. So, and, and Chelmsford, in fact, he wasn't actually fired. He was simply subordinated to Woolsey. And this is the problem. He wouldn't take it. Now, General Buller, when he was subordinated to Roberts in the, in the Second Anglo-Boer War, he didn't go home, hang on for another year, in fact, commanding in the field in Natal. Chelmsford said, well, I'm off, I'm resigning. Threw his toys out of the pram. I, and he flounced off as fast as he could go, which meant, in fact, that was the end of his military career. He never got another command. Um, he got offered some home commands, but they were very expensive. Um, Chelmsford wanted to go back to India. They weren't interested in that. So he basically ended up as a courtier general. The Queen and the Prince of Wales were very keen on him, um, became Lieutenant of the Tower, he became um, Colonel of the Second Horse Guards and did various other things, so um, became um, Gold Stick, in fact, just before Queen Victoria died. This was carried on by Edward, the, Edward the Seventh, so that he turned into a grand old man of, <laughs> of the army um, and a royal courtier, seen on all important occasions, you know, uh, on important royal occasions, but never again in the field. You know, that was finished. And having studied the man in depth for so many years, mm. how would you assess his performance as a military commander? Mm. I know it's a big question. No, no, it's just, it's... If, if there hadn't been a Santa Juana and the war had gone more or less to plan, he would have been pretty unremarkable, and I doubt if we'd be having this interview because you know, nothing special happened. It's, it's a sound, I mean, you're not interviewing me about the Ninth Cape Frontier War, you know. <laughs> um, you know, so, I mean, the Zulu War was supposed to run like the Ninth Cape Frontier War, and it didn't. So it was a major disaster of its Santa Luana, which put a whole new spin on it. And Chelmsford, who had spent his whole life as a, 
highly successful staff officer um, and is a perfectly com competent field commander in the 9th Cape Frontier War. Um, you know, this really was the blight of his career. This was the disaster he couldn't get over. Um, it's interesting, the spy cartoon of Chelmsford in 1881 just simply has Isandula. And everybody would have known Isandula equals Chelmsford. And Chelmsford, he could say what he liked. He went to the grave as Isandula and that particular disaster. So what do you think of Lord Chelmsford? Let me know in the comments below. I'm sure there'll be a good debate about that. If you want a longer version of this interview, you can check out my podcast, the Redcoat History Podcast, available on all good podcasting apps, where I've let the whole thing run and we go into a lot more detail about Lord Chelmsford's background. I also have my own book, which you can get for free when you sign up at my mailing list over at redcoathistory.com newsletter. All right, guys, take care. I'll see you soon.